Excellent. So let's see what questions we have today. You know, often I think that to encourage questions, we should have a prize for the best question. <laughs> and I always think the prize for the best question would be to get a free haircut. <laughs> I'm very good at <laughs> cutting hair. But I think we won't get any questions if I give a prize like that. Anyway, dear Ajahn Brah, it is indeed very delightful to be able to meet you. I'm always careful about questions like this because it starts and then that's something nice and usually gets much worse when you get to the bottom. <laughs> How to deal with this situation in a harmony way? When someone likes to pick live fish, crabs and seafood for dinner, despite being advised best not to do it, and the advice agitated him, and being told I'm difficult, when the live food is cooked, should I eat it or not? When I don't eat, it agitated him even more. So much so I have begun, begun to decline going out with him for food. I think that's you know, fair enough because you know, if you actually see the food there and you say, I want that one. I remember seeing this cartoon once of these lobsters in a restaurant and the lobsters, they were in the tank, they were saying, pick him, pick him, not me. <laughs> Those poor lobsters must be terrified. So. I think you have the right to say, well, what you want to do is what you want to do, but for me, I can choose something else in that restaurant. I don't need to eat the lobster or the crab or the fish or whatever. I think that's much better. Uh, it's always a difficult situation, but sometimes if the food is already killed, then it doesn't feel as bad if you're eating. And there is something to that. You know, it's not as if you're trying to hide the fact that you know, these things are killed, but then if you're responsible for it in a much more direct way, it feels much worse. It has a deeper psychological impact on you. If you see it, and you order it, or you do it. So that's why sometimes there is a difference karmically and psychologically, if, you know, that you, you get it from a shop or something, you don't order it to be killed. As for monks in the Theravada tradition, there was the time when I was a young monk, the first year as a monk, and I mentioned to you that the food we ate was very, very coarse. You know, it was not... Um, vegetarian food because there was no vegetarian food. There were snails and ants eggs and frogs. But then one day this westerner who'd married a local Thai girl came to our monastery and said, oh, it's Christmas coming up soon. Now I've raised a few turkeys. Would you like a turkey for Christmas? And he said, I'll choose one for you. And that is specifically against our rules. You can't choose and just you know, say, well, I'll have that one, I'll have that one. So we had to say no. So instead we had sticky rice and frog. <laughs> that hurt. <laughs> but nevertheless, you've got to keep the rules. So I think it's much better if you can avoid that. And honestly, you know, stick to your own what you need to do. You don't have to follow what other people do to please them. Say, this is how I feel. If I'm going to go out for dinner with you, you must respect me as well. Here's the next one. I also remember, because I was a school teacher for one year, I would teach maths and physics at school. But then one of my um, 
one of my sort of uh, scholars, the scholars, no, schoolboys, that he was a farmer's son. And they needed, you know, for a biology class, you know, to have a rabbit, you know, to dissect so that people in the class could understand, you know, what the parts of a rabbit was. And he was a, he was a farmer, so his father had many rabbits. So he said, I can bring one tomorrow for you, sir. Not for me, but this is for the, the uh, biology teacher. And he made the mistake that he brought a live rabbit into the school. And this live rabbit, I was his maths teacher, so I saw the rabbit too. It was so cute. And everybody was stroking it and petting it, and they fell in love with it very quickly. But then the biology teacher needed it killed to dissect. So this farmer's son said, oh, I've done that many times. I could do that for you, sir. And he did that. And then he came to ask some advice from me because nobody in his class would talk to him. His girlfriend at school said, right, that's it. I'm dumping you. You're a murderer. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I felt sorry for this poor young man. He was just doing what the teacher asked him, but the teacher wouldn't do it. And I felt so sorry. I said, look, don't do that anymore. You get somebody else to buy a rabbit from the shop or something. So please don't you ever do that again. Anyone? Some people say, some people say anything. <laughs> I've heard some of the weirdest things from other people. Well, some people say, when one goes into deep meditation, the soul can actually leave the body. Is this true? No way. Because of these weird things which people say, that I can't sort of use the usual words they say over in Australia, which is you know, a double word, uh, so I usually use a word in Pali instead. I say that's a lot of Gomayang. And Gomayang is a Pali word. Go means a bull, and Mayang is what comes up out of the backside of a bull. <laughs> so I say that's Gomayang. <laughs> and then people don't criticize me for using bad words. You go into deep meditation, the soul can actually leave the body, it doesn't leave the body. It doesn't have to leave the body, it's having such a wonderful time inside. Who wants to leave anywhere when everything is so beautiful and blissful and safe and rewarding? Why would you want to leave? So you're perfectly safe. It's not true, it's Gomaya. If yes, well it's a no, so I don't have to read on. But, I would actually read on, it said, if yes, but it's a no, how would the soul know the way to go back into the body? This is something else, like out-of-the-body experiences. And if this ever happens to you, if you go into deep meditation, this can't happen to you. But if ever you sort of float out of your body, then how to get back again? Sometimes people get panicky and they don't know how to get back in. And because of the fear and trying too hard, it gets difficult for them. They get back eventually. But the trick to be able to do that, if you do leave your body and you want to get back in, use what hypnotists do. They say, at the count of 10, you will come out of hypnosis. <coughs> 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, but much lower than that. It gives your mind a chance to uh, slowly adapt itself to go back inside. And that's exactly what you do if ever you leave the body and you want to come back in. Tell yourself, I'll come back into the body after the count of 10. 10, I do it slowly. And that's always works. Just you need time. 
for the mind to actually to relax and come back in. I thought I'd mention that because sometimes people do leave their body. There was this one guy, he was a Burmese. And he was a good meditator, but he also had the ability to leave his body and go astral traveling whenever he wanted. And so he, he, was, he was a Burmese, but he married a nice English lady. And he got a job doing air conditioning units, had a big contract to do an air conditioning units for the new prison up in Darwin, which is a long way away. And he loved his wife, but he was really jealous of her. And so when he was doing the job, the air conditioning job over in Darwin, every now and again, he would come and visit his wife. Not in a plane, not in a bus, not in a car. He just float out of his body and check out what she was up to. And I, I knew both of them. They're very cute. And she, because she was married to him, she wasn't a Buddhist, but because she was married to him, she could actually sense when he was around. And he would tell, uh, he would tell him. He said, Keith, Keith. I know you're around, I won't cheat on you, go back to Darwin. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what he used to do. There was another guy I met in jail, and this guy was from Yugoslavia. And he said that when he was a young, a baby, or not baby, a boy, maybe four or five years of age, he got really, really, really sick. They were doing an operation on him in a hospital somewhere in Yugoslavia. And he died on the operating table. And then all the doctors panicked. And then he was floating outside of the body. And he could know, even as a four or five year old kid, what the problem was. And the doctors weren't looking at it. So he just willed the doctors, don't look over there, look over here. And one of the doctors, somehow or other, could understand him and looked and said, hey, here's a problem over here. So they could actually remedy the, uh, the problem, and he survived the operation. And he said from that time on, he could always leave his body whenever he wanted. So he said he didn't mind being in prison. If he wanted to go out and watch a football match, they couldn't stop him. <laughs> <laughs> he just floated out of his body and went, and then came back later on. He said, so it has some advantage. <laughs> okay, next question. Dear Ajahn Brahm, is social drinking acceptable as in compliance with the five precepts? Of course it is. As long as it's apple juice, tea, coffee. That's what I call social drinking, not alcohol. Do you want to? I was a bit afraid today because Chow Po. And he got me these small bottles of apple juice. We usually have the big ones, and I can't finish them, and a lot gets wasted. So I had these small bot bottles. But I looked at the label, and it was called Bundaberg Apple Cider. When I grew up, cider was always alcoholic. But because Chow Po gave it to me, I said, it must be okay. But still, it was very nice, but then when I went back uh, this afternoon, I checked it out on the internet. It was non-alcoholic. <laughs> 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 Otherwise, you'd see a drunk monk here today. <laughs> because when you haven't had any alcohol at all for almost 50 years, you get really sensitive. On one Christmas time, one of the Canadian monks in Thailand, his parents sent him some wine gums. It's a Christmas present. And wine gums are just sweets. And I thought they were just sugar. I never had any, but he shared them with two or three other monks who are very senior now. And those four monks eating wine gums <laughs> got drunk. <laughs> and then we checked. Then we checked 
you know, the, the ingredients on the, the packet, and yet it was real wine in them. And it was not that much wine, it wouldn't send almost anybody drunk, but because they were monks, they never had wine for so many years. One was actually a Thai monk. And he, <laughs> we kept it secret for many years, we didn't want to embarrass anybody. It wasn't their fault, they didn't intentionally drink the alcohol, it was just part of the sweets. So you have to be a bit careful when you have, you're keeping those five precepts or the 227 precepts for monks for such a long time. Even a small amount of alcohol has a huge effect on you. So when you say to monks sometimes get drunk, yeah, I've seen it. <laughs> not me, not me, not me. I'm <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the most alcohol I've ever taken in was when one of these, I'll tell the whole story. You know, as monks, we don't just sit there and let people look after us. You know, we do a lot of work ourselves. You see me doing a lot of work. So we had our new center over in Perth, and we wanted to have a grand opening. So I said, well, let's, you know, let's invite the governor of Western Australia. You know, he's like the Queen's representative in that state, a big shot. And he can only say no. So I wrote the invitation, and to our surprise, he said, yes, I'll come to your opening. He was such a wonderful man and a great sort of coup for our centre. So I was told to arrange for all of the uh, tables, chairs, the tents, the marquees, and I was told this was such an honor to get the governor coming, no expense spared. So I rang up one of the most expensive um, hire companies in the whole of Perth. And I told them how important this was to us. Can you get the very, very best? And when the truck came, I was busy helping somebody else. I didn't notice when they unloaded the tents and the chairs. The tent was filthy, like it had been in some outback um, bush ceremony, and it had lots of dirt all over it. The chairs, they were also dirty, but then we could always uh, hose down the, the tent, we could always wipe down the chairs. But the chairs for the VIPs, we had a dozen chairs for the governor and his wife and a few other dignitaries. Not one of those chairs, not one of them had legs the same length. They all wobbled. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is going too far. What if the governor, during the ceremony, leans a little bit and the whole chair collapses? That would be very embarrassing. And so, I rang up the shop. I said, do you remember me? I ordered all these chairs and tables and uh, tents, the tents are filthy, but we fix that. But the chairs for the VIPs, look, none of them are acceptable. They all wobble, every one of them. Can you please change them? And she said, oh, there must have been some mistake. I'm terribly sorry. Yes, I'll have them changed straight away. It was a Friday afternoon. Now, in Australia, it's very, very, very different than than uh, Penang. On a Friday afternoon, the workers, they finish at 5 p.m. They don't work any longer than that. Usually even 4.30 they go home. Actually, they don't go home. They go to the pub and start their evening drinking. And so I never knew this, but the owner of this hire company had to go to the pub where all the people were having a weekend drink, and tell them, the Buddhists need their chairs changed. And these people weren't Buddhists. They didn't respect the Buddhists. They were very upset, but they had no choice. They had to go back to work. This time I waited for the truck. When the truck came round the corner, I saw it coming. 
and had a few men inside. One of those men jumped out the truck. He was still moving, maybe 20 kilometers an hour, 30 kilometers an hour. He jumped out and came running towards me. Where's the bloke in charge? I want the bloke in charge. He was really angry. So you know what happened? I went up to him and said, I am the bloke in charge. <laughs> and he put his fist this close to my nose. And you can see his eyes were red. In the suitors, they said that's what like angry spirits, yakas look like. Big red eyes, very wide. Fist right in front of you. And you could breathe all the alcohol which was in his stomach. Every time he breathed out, there was a huge amount of alcohol in there. And I always say that's the most alcohol I've ever imbibed in my 49 years as a monk. <laughs> but there he was, about to, as they say, punch my lights out. He was a big guy. I'm just a monk. He had his nose like, his fist like this. And all of my supporters, they call them supporters, I don't know if I should, all they did was watch. <laughs> <laughs> no one of them came to help me. <laughs> Thank you, supporters. I'm sure you did better, would you? You didn't need to because it's one of those lovely experiences when your meditation, understanding of the mind, understanding about interactions really uh, blossomed. I was not going to get arrogant. I was not going to get angry back. I just looked at him in peace and kindness. And a strange thing happened. He couldn't do anything. Because usually if you're going to have a fight or an argument, you look each other in the eye, I'm going to punch your lights out. Yeah, yeah, you, and you else. You have an argument. Please excuse the language. It's like foreplay before you have a fight. You can't just get right in there. And I wasn't playing. I just held him there. And it was a, not physically, just mentally. It was one of those amazing experiences that I knew I had full power over him. He couldn't say anything, he couldn't take a step back, he couldn't take a step forward, he couldn't do anything. He was stuck. And I just was enjoying that, I must admit. And then the, the truck had parked, and then the boss had come out from the truck and put his hand on this guy's shoulder and said, let's unload the truck. And I said, yes, I'll help you. So we unloaded the truck together. No violence. That's the closest I've ever got to being punched. You just, you couldn't do it. Because I noticed just how to diffuse violent situations. You don't get arrogant, you don't get cheeky. You just get very still. And people don't know what to do next. So anyway, that was my alcohol story. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Ajahn Brahm, thank you for making Buddhism so practical. Yeah, I'm sure that happens sometimes to you. People misunderstand. They get upset and angry and they want to hurt you. You don't let them. You can't rely upon your bodyguards. All my friends. <laughs> <laughs> if our consciousness, mind, lives on to another body and to enlightenment. Does it mean that our current mind has layers of our lives we have since lived and meditation allows us to penetrate the layers? You can put it that way, yes. You've had many lives before. How can you penetrate that? I am not allowed by our monastic rules to tell you about my past lives. And the reason for that is you don't want any monk to look special. And the reason for that, again, is the first year I was a monk with Ajahn Chah. Again, the food there was terrible. Sticky rice and rotten fish or frogs. And then this one day this guy came 
in a truck with lots and lots of food. You could smell it. It was no good food. And then he came into the dining room and said, is Ajahn Chah here today? And the senior monk said, no, he's in town today. So the guy got in his truck and drove away with no food given to us. He only wanted to give food to Ajahn Chah. There's much more good karma when you give food to an enlightened being than all these young monks who weren't enlightened yet. And that really hurt. You know, I was a young man, it's only 23, 24. I liked food and I wasn't getting any of it. And so that's one of the reasons why we never say who's enlightened and who isn't, or even past lives. But I'm also, I'd say I'm smart. I know the loopholes. <laughs> what I can tell you without getting into too much trouble. I love telling this story because it teaches you how to remember your past lives, or in particular, early lives. So once when I was meditating, had a nice meditation, it has to be nice hindrances, I was talking about this morning, but not in full, when the hindrances disappear. You can make a suggestion to your mind, it does whatever you ask it. So I asked my mind after coming out of a deep meditation, what is my earliest memory? Just that. Because my mind was ready through the meditation I'd just come out of, straight away, no pause, no effort, a memory came up. A very clear memory. I was in my baby's pram, maybe about six weeks old, seven weeks old, about that age. And I remembered it. It wasn't like a memory of like what you had for lunch today. It was, you were back there, a re-experiencing what it's like being a baby in your pram. And I remember the colors. I remember I had my favorite toy in there, a very light blue ceramic pig. Now, my mother was not sort of good with words, she just called it Porky. And I loved that little Porky the pig, my, one of my first toys when I was about six weeks old. And I could explore my um, pram, go under the covers and find out what was there. But one of the strange things I remembered was that the colors were not important. It was the smell of those uh, sheets, the smell of that little pig, my mother's smell. That's how I recognized everything. And the importance of smell to me as a six weeks old baby was paramount. And later on when I told that story to like a pediatrician, they said, actually, that's very accurate. The dominant sense when you are born is your sense of smell, not your sight, not even your hearing, but how things smell. That gave me the information that this was my pran, that was my mother. And those are kind of little information which you, no way I could have known that. I was a physicist, not sort of a, a doctor. And you understand how real that is. So that gave me, I didn't need confirmation because that was so real. But that gave me the confirmation, that's what it's like when you have these early memories. We check them out and they are real. And nowadays, if you can remember a previous life, even in Penang, what was it, about 70, 80 years ago, or 100 years ago, there are records. You can find if a man or a woman like that actually lived. And when you actually go and check those records, imagine what it does to you when you check them and you found out, yes, there was a person by that name at that time. 
and that is like goosebumps come up here. You can check that these are real past life memories. And they, they explain a lot too. They explain just why you are who you are, why you chose that career, why this is the stuff which you like and other stuff you don't like. It gives a lot of really interesting information. That's one of the reasons why if you get in a nice meditation, a deep meditation, try that. You're sitting here and as you come out, what is my earliest memory? See if you can get an early life memory first of all. And then earlier please. Many students do that, but there's a warning I have to give you. This is not a joke, this is serious. Sometimes you get the memory of the closest life you've had, your past life, and the closest time in that past life, which is often your death. And that's usually very, very uncomfortable. You're not just remembering this, you're back in that body, you're dying again. That's not nice. So if ever that happens, you try this method, what's my earliest memory? And you get something very unpleasant or painful. Please remember to say, earlier please. That's how your mind is at that time. Whatever you suggest, it will do. And that's one of the reasons why, once you have that possibility, and once you have those teachings, you can always go back earlier to a more pleasant time. And also, if you're going at that pleasant time, and maybe you're married, ask yourself, what's my wife's name? Or husband's name? What's my name? If you ask, you get the answer. Because the mind is, will do whatever you want in those deep meditations. And then you can check it afterwards. You get lots and lots of really interesting information. This is an example, not of recording past lives through meditation, but through hypnotic regression. There was a young lady in Sydney who was anorexic. She just would not eat. But if she did eat, she'd vomit afterwards. So she was getting so weak and so thin the doctors tried to cure her, they put her on medication, it wasn't working, they got a psychologist, psychiatrist, nothing was working. She was dying. And her mother decided to try a hypnotic regression. Take her to a hypnotist, she had to be there because the child was only about 16, and to regress her. And it worked. She remembered her past life. She said, in my past life, I was a younger of two sisters. My elder sister was more attractive. I was plain. And we both fell in love with the same boy. Because my sister was more attractive, she married that boy. And I was so heartbroken I committed suicide. I killed myself. And I remember that was my past life. That's why I'm trying so hard in this life to look more attractive by trying to be thin. Now that could be just a very interesting memory gained through past life regression, hypnosis basically. But then the mother who was supposed to be just you know, looking after her girl, she went crazy. She was crying and screaming, going ballistic. So that poor uh, hypnotist, who was also a psychologist, had to calm two people down, the daughter and the mother. And once she calmed the mother down, why were you screaming like that? And the mother said, I was her sister. I never told my daughter this. When I was young, I had a young daughter, a young sister, sorry. I had a young sister, 
We both fell in love with the same guy. That's my husband, her father. And when I married that boy, my youngest sister was so heartbroken, she committed suicide. He never told my daughter this. You don't tell family secrets like that. That was her. We were sisters before. Now I'm her mother, and she's desperately trying to be attractive. Those are the kind of stories which kind of explain so much about why these things happened. She became the daughter of her sister in the previous life, because that's one way she could get close to the man she loved, who is now her father. The emotional world is very powerful. Okay. How does the predator versus the prey theory align with the first precept of not killing a living being? How do we ensure a balance in our ecosystem? Remember the five precepts only apply to human beings. They do not apply to say tigers. You try and give the tiger five precepts. <laughs> but you know, in the jungle, you know, the tigers are not the problem. I don't know of any monk who's been killed by a tiger. But I know many monks who have died because of tiger. <laughs> <laughs> They're the dangerous ones. <laughs> so that's an old joke. This is one of the, I, I dropped these, I don't know which one I've answered, which one I am. Oh yeah. Okay, next question. Is it a prerequisite to follow the Eightfold Path before one can achieve jhana? Or isn't it a requirement to achieve enlightenment? Now, jhanas can happen without being enlightened. Jhanas is one of the factors you need to, uh, to cultivate to become enlightened. But sometimes people get jhanas without enlightenment. Sometimes people kind of, they fluke the jhana. They press the letting go button. They're not even Buddhists. I've known many people like that. Even years ago, there was a lady here in Penang. Do you remember this, Chao Po? There was a lady who, you know, she was told by her um, therapist, psychologist, doctor, that she was going crazy. She had some sort of experience, she hadn't got a clue what it was. And you said, Ajahn Bao, can you give it a try? Find out what happened to her. And this was again in the library at Mahindarama. You know, she talked to me, so what happened? And then she explained what had occurred to her. And I was just so kind of pleased and excited. I said, what you just experienced was a classical first jhana experience. I don't know how you did that because you weren't a Buddhist, you weren't keeping precepts or anything. And I gave a few more details of what that first jhana is like. And she was really happy. Yes, that's what happened. Yes, at last somebody understands what I went through. Yes. And I said, it's not a psychological um, trauma. It was very lovely, just understand it. The likelihood is it won't happen again because you're not a Buddhist, you don't go to meditation retreats, you just fluked one. You really let go. So she went away very happy. Do you remember her? I've never seen her again, not quite sure what she did next. But it was just these jhanas are more common than people think. And sometimes you just really, really let go. That's a trick. You don't do anything, you don't want to attain anything or get anything. You just totally abandon. And sometimes you get so still, so peaceful, so joyful, the jhana happens, whether you like it or not. 
But because she didn't know what was going on, no one could explain it to her. When someone could explain it to her, she was so grateful. But usually, the more you practice the Eightfold Path, the more precepts you keep, the more good you are, the more kind you are, the more you have good speech and good action and good livelihood, the easier it becomes. It's never impossible. Dear Ajahn, is righteous anger ever justified? No. There's no such thing as righteous anger. It's just like trying to, to whitewash it. I needed to get angry. Often when we witness injustice and cruelty towards those who do not deserve such indignation, the righteous anger propels us to take action to right the wrong. You just add more to the wrong if you start with anger. You just like righteous solving problems without anger. You know that I've noticed this when someone gets angry for no, you can understand why someone has done something really, really wrong and they get angry at you. You don't see what the error was, you just see that person's anger. And it's much, much, much better to just put the anger aside and just tell, you shouldn't have done that, that hurt somebody else. Why did you do that? And if you just say it coolly, the message is what the other person remembers, rather than just the anger they received. And even when I was a school teacher, I could do that. A kid made a mistake, they treated somebody badly. I didn't get angry at them and shout at them. I just said, if they did that to you, how would you feel? And just try to make them feel, you know, put it in the other shoes, what they would feel like if they received what they gave to somebody else. And that was far more powerful. If I got angry at them or beat them or something, they would just be afraid of me. They wouldn't understand why they were being punished. So it's much, I've always found it much better to put the anger aside and say what you need to say with a cool tongue. Honestly, have you always been doing the correct thing on these retreats? Have you made mistakes? Have you been selfish sometimes? Have I ever shouted at you? How many people have I ever shouted at, Chapo? How long have you known me? Have you always done the right thing? <laughs> You know, I, I will tell you, you know I told the story about the Mont Blanc pen. You know who gave me that Mont Blanc pen? <laughs> <laughs> he was only doing that out of a kind heart. He just wanted to give me something. He respected me. He wanted to give me a pen which I knew, he knew I needed, which would write very easily for me. I always thank him for that. Never shout at him. That's one of the reasons why, if it's shouting you do, people remember the anger. They never remember the why you were upset. So I just do not agree with righteous anger. And if everybody gets angry, <laughs> <laughs> I just can't do it. Okay, let's try another question. <clears throat> If someone invents a weapon of mass destruction, okay, or indoctrinates society with a dangerous destructive ideology intending for it to last for many generations, and you got here, he actually succeeds. Why did you write he? <laughs> <laughs> Don't sometimes women lead? Men, women, doesn't really matter. If anyone does this, destructive ideology, intending it for last for a generation, will the mastermind behind this atrocity continue to reap the passive reparker from his horrendous actions in his future as long as his creation is still bringing pain and suffering to others as they intended? 
would as we parker ever, we parker is a calming result, ever be exhausted? So if there's no winded question, I can clarify if the question is unclear. I understand that. The way of karma is quite strange. That karma is over when that person decides what a stupid thing it was. Ask forgiveness, forgives themselves, and decides never ever to do that again. It's strange, the law of karma is not as black and white as many people feel. When I was visiting the Buddhist monument in Java, Bodh Padur, I was taken around there by the monk Venerable C. Panyawara. He was a very good friend. And I gave good talks and he kept on inviting me back. He keeps on saying that the book which I wrote, The Art of Disappearing, was the best Buddhist book on meditation he'd ever read. He gave me that kind of praise. But when I went to visit him, in uh, board, no, in Jogjakarta, he gave me a guided tour of the monument of Bhad Padur. And there was one carving at the very bottom which really impressed me. There was this man whose brain was being cut by a razor wheel. It was a punishment for um, pushing his mother over and injuring her. And a full story as told to me by Venerable Si Panyawaro was that this man had gone into one of the hell realms because he'd pushed his mother over and injured her. And there he saw another man who's having his head cut with a razor wheel, enormous pain. And the first man said, oh, you've come. I was told 3,600 years ago, or something like that, that another person would come who'd done the same terrible cruel act that I had done and pushed over my mother. And when they come, the razor wheel will, will leave me and will go to the next person. That person is you. And so immediately the razor wheel left the first man's head he paid off his karma and went into the new man's head. And it was cutting him, it was incredibly painful. But this second man made a resolution. He said, it was a terrible thing I did, injuring the woman who gave me life, who cared for me and brought me up. I shouldn't have done that. But I'm going to take not just 3,600 years, I'm going to take three times that, so the next person, the person afterwards, does not have to endure any pain at all. I will take their punishment. That was out of compassion. And he had such a kind heart, thinking of others, not just his own pain, that the razor wheel exploded and disintegrated, and that man went straight to heaven, a heavenly realm. That is actually how these hells and heavens actually work. If you ever find yourself going to an unpleasant realm of existence after this life, please remember kindness, compassion. And because you've got a kind, compassionate heart, you cannot persist in one of the hell realms. You will just disappear from there immediately. That's one of the reasons why I say the doors of hell are always open. You can leave whenever you want, whenever you've learned you know, what actions is, actions are, and what forgiveness is, what compassion is. If you can be compassionate in one of the hell realms, you can't stay there. I, that's a beautiful story, and it's so true. If you've got a real kind, compassionate heart, and of course when you die you go to some heavenly realm or back in this realm, but in a beautiful body, you can't go any other place. 
Basically, you just don't belong there. Does that make sense to you? What is your view on the Dutanga practice? Is it particularly helpful for individuals with certain temperaments and tendencies? Thank you. There are many types of Dutanga practices. One of them is hanging out in cemeteries. And I, I loved that. When I was a young monk in Thailand, you know, you would go to a village and ask, where's the nearest cemetery? And that's where you'd put your mosquito net and umbrella in the cemetery. And the reason I loved it, because that was the only place you could get peace and quiet. None of the villagers would ever go into the cemetery. They were scared stiff of the cemetery. And me, I just went into the cemetery and had some nice meditation. And when people asked, aren't you afraid of the ghost? I said, no, the ghosts all speak Isan language. I can't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> And anyway, there's one thing I think I've told you. Ghosts are afraid of monks. Really afraid of them. And I know that from experience, going to see some ghosts. I was going, going looking for them. When I saw them, they looked at me and they said, I can speak Isan language. They said, you can see us. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> and they all ran away. Look at human beings. Human beings in one level realm, just underneath the, the heavenly beings. Human beings, underneath those is the animal realm. Underneath the animal realm is the ghost realm. We're two levels higher than they are. We've got way more power than ghosts have. The only thing is, we don't understand that. We don't use that extra power. But if any of you have any trouble with ghosts, here or anywhere, as long as I'm here in Penang, you just send them to Chow Po's house. <laughs> as long as I'm still here, okay? Otherwise, you'll never let me stay in this house anymore. And you tell them, get out of here. They're scared of humans, and especially monks and nuns. That's why we've got the power to get rid of them for you. Anyway, that's one Dutanga practice. What are the other Dutanga practices? When you're very young, you can do all these Dutanga practices. Sometimes they're very ascetic, but you want to find a middle way. Don't go too far. Just one of the other Dutanga practices is, you know, you go on arms round and you take basically everything you own with you. And that was a sort of asceticism. That was one of the most beautiful times of my life. When you went on Dutanga, you just had your bowl and your robe and umbrella. You had everything you ever owned with you. You carried it, you walked. You didn't get any cars or buses. You walked, and soon you let go of so many excessive things which you didn't really need, you thought you needed, but you didn't. And I remember just going to any crossroads in Thailand. I didn't need a map. I could go left, right, turn around, go backwards, or go straight on. I had no place to go. I had no uh, schedule I had to meet. I didn't have to get up at a certain time. I didn't need to reach anywhere at a certain time. You had this total freedom. And you could go to any village, any village, and go on arms round. You'd always get some rice, and usually something else to go with that rice. Anyway, you didn't need any money. You didn't have any fear at all. You felt so free. You were just like a bird, as the Buddha said. The bird just carrying the weight of its wings. That wasn't very heavy at all. That's all a time when I look back on it. The time which I look back with so much nostalgia. The beautiful time. Go anywhere. You walk. You feel totally free. 
That kind of do tango is gorgeous. I better stop talking about it otherwise. Ooh. These days, you say, if you really want to be a Dutanga monk, give up your mobile phone. <laughs> a lot of people say, oh, oh, I can't do that. Dear Ajahn Bhama, do you allow personal retreat in your monastery for man and woman? If yes, how does it work and when? <laughs> Not in the monastery, but just opposite the monastery, we've got Jhana Grove Retreat Centre. There we have many organized retreats. So we've got Kaisi's retreat coming in May. If you want to go there, because you know him, and join that retreat, once you've been on one retreat there, then you can always ask, can I come on a, they call it self-retreat. You go have a teacher there. The monks are on the opposite side of the road if you get in any trouble. You have a room, and the room has got its own suite. You either make your own breakfast in the morning, you just walk over to the monastery where you get food. As long as there's a room there, you can stay there. And you have the personal retreats. And you know, those are just, I don't know why more people don't do those. You organize yourself, there's no bells. Get up when you want, go to bed when you want. As long as you're there, not just to relax and hang out, but you're there to d uh, develop your meditation at your rate, how you want to do it. And that is so gorgeous. Many people, long-term meditators, they love making use of that facility. Because it's ours, we, I built it, that's why you can go and use it. It's gorgeous. But of course, it has to be being used for the right purpose. You're just using it for meditation. I will probably tell you to turn off your mobile phones when you go there. If I see you just using your mobile phone all day, so I'm having a nice holiday here, got no responsibility, good food, I can rest all the time, and you get on your mobile phone and do all sorts of business deals and other deals, that's not using it properly. But I will trust you. So use it for peace and quiet and stillness. I often heard Buddhists talking about emptiness. What is emptiness? Emptiness is nothing at all. Sometimes people ask me, Ajahn Brahm, it's coming up to Christmas time. In Christmas time, in the Western world, we usually give presents to people we care about. Ajahn Brahm, you've, you've taught us so much. You sacrifice your time for us. Can I get you a birthday present? Not Christmas present, sorry. I say, okay. If you want to give me a Christmas present, get a little box, doesn't matter how big, nice wrapping on the outside, a nice little bow on the outside. To Ajahn Brahm, thank you. Merry Christmas. And don't put anything inside. When I open it, I think, ah, there's nothing inside. That's what I've always wanted. Thank you. The gift of nothing. It's not a joke. It's expressing that sometimes all these other things which you possess, which take up so much space in your cupboards and on your shelves, do you really need it? Wouldn't it be wonderful just to give people the gift of nothing? Emptiness, freedom. But don't do that because you know, don't, there's nothing in the box, but it's all the box you have to get rid of afterwards. <laughs> Okay. Do you understand what emptiness is? Nothing there. Okay, I, I shouldn't really resist this story. <coughs> Ajahn Chah was a great monk. He gave amazing talks, sometimes boring talks, and sometimes he'd give you just one or two words 
which made all the difference to you. And this was one of those occasions when he just said one or two words, which was so incredibly powerful. And the reason behind this, Ajahn Chah was getting sick, and one of the monks knew that in monasteries in ancient times, they had saunas. Saunas were not invented in Sweden, they had them in Indian monasteries from the time of the Buddha. So they thought, let's build a sauna for Ajahn Chah. It may improve his health. That was one of the reasons we built the sauna. The other reason was, well, if Ajahn Chah comes to our monastery for a sauna, he also has to give us a talk as well. It was kind of selfish. We saw more of our teacher. And it worked perfectly. We built the sauna, and Ajahn Chah would come once a week to take a sauna. Before getting into the sauna, he would give us a Dhamma talk. Some days those talks were ordinary, but this particular day, the talk he gave was just so, so inspiring. And once you hear an inspiring talk, you have all this gorgeous energy inside of you. And I had heard this talk, I was just so inspired. There were many other monks who could look after Ajahn Chah in the sauna. I'd done that last week, let some other monks look after him. I went to the back of the hall, where no one could see me, crossed my legs on the concrete floor, and got into a really lovely meditation for a couple of hours. That's what happens when you get inspired. Meditation becomes so easy. And after coming out of the meditation, I didn't know what the time was, and I thought, well, maybe I can still do some service for my teacher, Ajahn Chah. So I got up and walked towards the sauna. I was too late. Ajahn Chah had finished his sauna, because he was walking towards me on the path together with uh, his Thai attendant to go back to his car and go back to his monastery, not our Western monastery. But I was going to cross him on the path. So when I got close to him, I stopped. Ajahn Chah stopped. And he looked at me. He looked at me and was reading my mind. It's a weird thing to say, but when you have a very peaceful mind, I just come out of a deep meditation. You can feel when somebody is looking inside of you. It's like he was exploring inside. And for once I did not mind. My mind had just come out of a good meditation. I was quite happy with it. Come and have a look at my mind like this, Ajahn Chah. I was quite proud. And I felt him inside. And then he came out. This is the best way I can describe it. It's it doesn't make sense, but it makes so much sense to me because I felt it. And then he looked at me. Brahma Wangsa. He was fierce, not angry, but fierce. Brahma Wangsa. Why? He asked me the question, why? And I answered, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and I was still stupid. And he started laughing. And that was a wonderful thing about being with an enlightened master like Ajahn Chah. He never scolded you, he never got angry. When you did something really stupid, he laughed his head off. I caused so much enjoyment for my teacher, and so much laughter. But then he screwed up his, his face again. Brahma Wangsa. If anybody asks you that question again, the answer is this, the answer to the question, why? And I was really excited. Every time I tell this story, I pause here. Do you want to know the answer? The answer to the question, why? From one of the greatest masters, he said, the answer to the question, why, is, there's nothing. There's nothing. 
in Thai it is my, me, or I. There's nothing. They look to me with a lot of kindness. Do you understand? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, no, you don't. <laughs> And from excitement, I went way down. And that was terrible. You just had this great teaching and you blew it. But I always remembered it. That's the answer to the question, why? Nothing. Do you understand? No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> if you did, you'd be enlightened. <coughs> Can you explain the meaning of upeka, equanimity? I understand the term as something, making judgment, or not making judgment of good or bad when anything arises. But I recently read that the Chinese tr translation for upeka is letting go in Chinese. Thank you, Ajahn Brahm. I love the Chinese translation. It widens your understanding of the use of these words. I never like the usual English word equanimity. That is so cold. Which is one of the reasons why when I talk about equanimity in like the jhanas, especially the fourth jhana, I much prefer the term contentment. It's really deep peace, but joyful. And sometimes people say, but look, in the fourth jhana, you're not supposed to have any joy. Yes, there is. And you look at other suttas, what are called upeka sukha, the happiness of equanimity. I prefer like contentment. It literally means just looking on. That's the literal meaning, just looking on. But it really means just, you're so content, so at peace. You don't need anything. And just to let you know, the fourth jhana, which is where equanimity or upeka or contentment reaches its peak, is also where mindfulness becomes strongest and purest. That's the culmination of mindfulness in the fourth jhana. <clears throat> That's when you really understand how powerful mindfulness can be. Hmm. <clears throat> Thank you for that Chinese translation, that's good. It's like one of the other words, samadhi. What does samadhi mean? It is, does not mean concentration. That's one of those translations which has caused a lot of trouble for people. Okay, I get this old joke which I told earlier out of the way. If samadhi, meditation, meant concentration, when what is this place? A concentration camp. <laughs> it's not that at all. If you try to concentrate, that's so much stress, you have no happiness at all. And the jhanas are barred for you. It does not mean concentration. And even the Chinese translation, we had this Chinese lady, she was a professor from Stanford, and she was, she'd come to Bodhinyan, oh actually to Jhana Grove for a month or two months at a time because no one knew her there, so she'd do her meditation. And she told me, I promised, I would not tell anybody when she used to go there that she was visiting, otherwise the local universities would send limos out to get her to give a, a talk somewhere. She was so well known. And when I gave the talk, the, Samadhi doesn't mean concentration, it means stillness. She looked to me after and said, of course it does. Because in the Chinese translations of the Tipitaka, they always use a couple of Chinese characters which means stillness. It never means concentration. You see, English, we blew it and gave it the wrong translation. The Chinese, did much better. So that means stillness. So if it means stillness, how can you get still by working hard? You get tired, you get tense. How can you be still? 
Relax. Okay. I can't do this. I usually do this uh, with someone coming up close. This bottle is half full of water. How can I get this water to be still? Hold it. Be mindful. Struggle. Strive. Be still. If you try and keep a cup of water still, you'll get very tired and very frustrated. There's only one way to get this water to be still, and that is let it go. Put it down. Stop grasping. Stop attaching. Let go. So once you realize that the meditation is stillness, you understand why letting go is the most important part of the path to stillness. And how easy it is once you know what letting go is. You understand why that lady who was, you know, from Penang just got into meditation into a jhana sort of by chance. Goodness. We've got part four here, I don't know what part three or part two or part one is. That's like upeka, equanimity, contentment is much better. But that's not really too important. What's most really important is that uh, samadhi, being stillness. Okay, there we go. Question one. Are nimittas, colors, walls, texture, cloth, etc. Nimittas are the way you experience the mind, the sixth sense. Because we don't have language and concepts to understand the mind, when we see it, we usually see it as an object of one of the other five senses, depending upon which sense dominates you. Because most people are dominated by the visual sense of seeing, that when a nimitta comes, it's usually perceived as a sight, a light, a color. You know it's a nimitta because your eyes are closed. You're not seeing anything. Your eyes are turned off. Sight is not functioning. Which means that the light you see it's not a color which you can see in the real world. It's similar but much deeper. A deeper white, a deeper yellow. That's a classical sign of a nimitta. Sometimes people can see nimittas, not seeing them, but experience them as sounds. If they're very, very dominated by sounds, maybe musicians. And if they do, it's the most incredible, beautiful sound you've ever heard. Feelings. I've never really um, seen a meditator experience the nimitta through feelings, the, the fifth sense. Smells. I have uh, seen people experience the nimitta as smells, but it's the most fragrant of smells you've ever smelt in your whole life. It has nothing to do with the world. I've never, actually, yes, uh, with scents as well. Those, it's like, you know, the most fragrant of smells. It doesn't exist in the world, but it's similar. What you're using, you're trying to borrow your experience from other senses to re describe this experience, which is you know, purely of the mind, not of uh, the sense of smell or taste or touch. So that's actually what they are. And because they're not of this world, they're usually very beautiful. And that's the other thing. They always come with a lot of pity sukha, a lot of happiness with them. They're not to be feared. They're beautiful things. And they energize you. They let go of the, of the, uh, the hindrances. So those nimitas are a good sign that you're getting somewhere deep in your meditation. Later on when you you fall into those nimittas, you get into the jhanas. That's really powerful. 
During nimittas, if we can still hear noises not clear and our mind can still talk to us, are they nimittas or something else? If you can still think, talk to yourself, then it's usually not a nimitta or a very weak nimitta. It's usually that verbal movement of the mind is gone by the time the nimittas arise. Also, that hearing sounds, sounds or one or two sounds can sometimes penetrate even a jhana, but only for a moment. That's the last of the five senses which totally turn off the sounds. It's one of the reasons why when you're asleep, you wake up because of the sound of your alarm clock. The sound is the last sense to be subdued. So, even if you see nimittas, if you can still hear noises, don't worry. Just as long as the nimitta is gorgeous and beautiful, the noises will get more and more distant. I realize that when we have enough, we are ready to let go, e.g. shopping <laughs> for luxury items, but it does leave a bit of an emptiness, a gap, as I feel something is missing. How do we fill this gap? Honestly, I can't understand shopping. I remember this guy, he was, he was Indian, quite wealthy, and he came and asked me, you know, can I present to you a TV screen, one of these big TV screens, I don't know how many feet wide. I said, we don't have a TV, no, but I, just, I, I want to present it to you. We don't need it. Why did you get it? He said, because it was on sale. <laughs> this was a guy. I thought that only happened with women. You buy things because it's on sale, not because you need it. So he said no, because I wanted to teach him a lesson. He's one of, on one of our committees now, this fellow. I said, no, only buy it if you need it. He said, not because you want it. And so he thought it was a good bargain, so he bought it, and he was trying to get rid of it for somebody. So I feel something is missing. I'm glad TVs are missing from my monastery. How do we fill this gap? Please don't. If you go for a walk in the park and you pick some mushroom flowers, is this stealing? If you do that from a monastery, for example, the, you know, we planted some bamboo years and years ago, and many people use bamboo shoots in their food. And so if ever they want bamboo shoots, they just ask me, can I have a bamboo shoot to make some curry or something? I said, yeah, sure. They ask me first. Sometimes they use some of that bamboo, new bamboo, and they put sticky rice inside of it and bake it. It's a type of food in the northeast of Thailand called khao lam. They can't get bamboo easily in Western Australia, so they come to us for it. So yeah, sure. They have to ask, first of all. If they don't ask, they don't have permission. It's a kind of stealing. So if ever you take something from the gardens here, just ask first of all. And they're always given to you, but if you don't ask, sometimes you may take something. You now we're always very generous. Can I take one of the donation boxes, please? <laughs> you ask first, and as long as it's empty, yeah, of course. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Dear Ajahn Brahm, what to do if you encounter a ghost? Thank you, Ajahn. First thing, if you encounter a ghost, don't be scared. If you want to run away, fine, but before you run away, ask the ghost for a lottery number. <laughs> the ghosts are very good with lottery numbers. Ask the number first and then run. <laughs> now, if you see a ghost, just be kind. Don't think about what you want. Just be kind to them, see what they need. And a lot of time, ghosts are like any other beings in this world, like a, a stray cat. What does the stray cat want? Maybe just a little bit of food. 
and you get so much happiness by giving a little cat a little bit of milk or some food. Otherwise it just goes in the bin and the cat gets fitter and healthier. A bird flying through the sky. Sometimes it lands, it may have a broken wing. You don't just leave it there or chase it away. If you possibly can, see what you can do to heal that wing. If you see a ghost, they're just like a being, like a, like a bird or a little cat. Just give them some kindness. Once you give them some kindness and you realize it is a ghost, you can say, well, look, it's not a very nice uh, place to be in the ghost realm. I'll make some merits for you today at the temple and I'll share them with you. So may you be happy and well and may you leave this realm of ghosts and get a nice rebirth in a higher realm. What a beautiful thing that is you can do. So that's what I would do if I saw a ghost. Hi Ajahn. If someone is suffering from a depression and under medication, how can we start them off with mindfulness meditation or should we introduce them to loving kindness meditation instead? What you can do is give them the, the um, Empress Free Questions meditation. Now is the most important time. The most important thing to be aware of is what's right in front of you. And the most important thing to do is to be kind, to care. Keep it simple. It's very, very powerful. Greetings, Ajahn Lumpur. Does Nimitta only happen during meditation? I've experienced he hearing beautiful group chanting by monks the first 30 seconds of waking up. If there is no such thing as external Nimitta, I guess it's about time I check in with the other bent and, f with the other bent and fallen trees. That could be the case. You know, sometimes it's when you first wake up, your mind is quite clear and fresh. It's got some energy. It's not carrying the burden of the past unless you've just had a, a strong dream. So you may be able to, when you first wake up, you know, hear this beautiful chanting. And if you do, you please enjoy it. Dear Ajahn, what can one do if she is particularly scared of being alone at night in the house, even though she has not seen a ghost before? Is this due to lack of brightness in one's mind in his or her bad karma in the past life? It's just according to your conditioning. If I was in an empty house, I love it, being in an empty house. It's calm, it's peaceful, no one disturbs me. So I see the benefits in being in an empty house. If you're sleeping in an empty house, you don't get disturbed by snoring. It's okay, Chapo, you don't snore. At least I haven't heard you anyway. <laughs> saying in his apartment. But it's, see the benefits of being in an empty house. Our problem is these days that you know, being a uh, Malaysian, very few of you grow up with a room for yourself. A lot of you sleep with your friends, with your brothers and sisters, many to a room. I actually would prefer that. I grew, grew up sharing a room with my brother all my life. There's always two to the room. What that meant, growing up, we fought, two young men, males, but we learned how to get on together. We had to. There was no one else, nowhere else to escape to. So because of that, even I became a monk, he became a banker. You know, he never admitted to his bosses that he had a younger brother who was a monk. <laughs> he thought it would be bad for his career. <laughs> well, because I'd renounced money. And he was making money. <laughs> So anyhow, but because we'd grown up together, we'd always love each other, we understand each other, we grow up together. I went to visit him recently with his uh, children and grandchildren. You know what they call me? These are my nephews and nieces. They call me Munkle. <laughs> Munkle Brown. 
Not uncle, but I'm but uncle. Yeah, it's quite cute. <laughs> so because we grow up together, I see the benefits of growing up together, you know, sharing a room. And to this day, I'd always recommend not to get big houses where your kids have their own room, where they have to share. We have to learn to get on with others. Because that's what our life is like. We have to learn to get on with other people. But if I do have the opportunity as a monk to have my own space, oh, that's the best. You have freedom there. You don't ever need to be afraid. Greetings. When I meditate, I sense warmth build. I sense warmth building up at my back area and back of upper arm. Is it possible to use this warmth to regenerate torn ligaments, e.g. in my eyes? If yes, how to do? Thank you. Sometimes if you feel hot spots in your body, it is a sign that some healing energy is happening. Many times in retreats, when people really get into their meditation, they come to the interviews and say, I had a hot spot in my neck. It got really hot. Pleasantly? Yeah, really nice. And I ask, when did you have your whiplash in the car accident? I've done that several times. And then the person who's asked me the question said, Ah, oh, Ajahn Brahm, you have got psychic powers. I never told you that. I had a bad car accident, had whiplash. And I never let anyone know that. How did you know? I said, it's just reason, logic. It's the most common accident, most common source of neck ache, whiplash in a car accident. And I said, you just got hot spots in your back of your neck. This is what happens when the meditation starts to get peaceful. The body has a chance to heal itself. If they just got hot another other times, you think, what's going on? I can't allow this. It's not natural. It's not normal. But if it happens during meditation, it's just really peaceful and the body has the opportunity to start healing itself. If any of you have hot spots in your body while you're meditating, please, well done. You're healing something. <coughs> Dear Ajahn, what advice do you have for us to be able to be born a Buddhist instead of other religious life? after life. Come on, one life at a time, present moment awareness. You haven't even finished today or finished this retreat and you're worrying about what you're going to do in your next life. <laughs> but the real answer is, if that's what you're inclined to, they always say in the suttas, if a tree is leaning to the west, that when it dies or gets chopped down, it will be likely to fall to the west. If you're always leaning towards meditation and dhamma, when you die, that's where you get reborn. During meditation, my body tends to sway, sometimes left and right, sometimes in a circle. The sway is coming from inside automatically. Should I stop the sway or let it stop by itself? No, let it happen. It's again, your body is learning how to heal itself. So let it sway. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, there's no danger there at all. But there's another thing which sometimes happens. Sometimes you think you're swaying, but you're perfectly still. It's strange. But I've even, some people say, no, I was swaying, I was mindful of it. And I took a video of them, here. And they thought, this is amazing. It really appeared to me as if my body was swaying. But you got the video there, I was perfectly still. It doesn't matter either way. Just let it happen, don't try and control anything, don't get afraid. Somehow or other, it's the body doing some healing for itself. Let it happen. Dear Ajahn, good evening. When we use the deceased money to do, do donations, charity, etc., how do we inform the deceased now that he, she is not around? 
Do we call out their names to inform them of their good deeds? You can do that, or you can just whenever you know, we do the sharing of merits in the temple. You say today, you know, this food has been donated for so-and-so who's passed away last week. And if you can, have a photo of them if they're close to you. You look at that photo, there's a kind of connection that happens with them. But also, I remember someone saying years ago, it's always better to donate with a warm hand than with a cold hand. I always like that saying. In other words, when you're still alive, then to make the donations with a warm hand, because then you really can feel it. If it's a cold hand, sometimes a person is already get reborn, or people don't know how to share the merits properly, so they don't receive them. But if it's with a warm hand, you know what you've done. And that gives you so much joy and happiness. <sighs> Even the small amount of donations I've given, I sometimes, when I go to bed at night, remember what I've done. And that brings me so much happiness, so much joy. You've actually taught some good meditation or taught some dharma and people have understood it. It's got their marriages back on, in line. It's healed their cancers. It's got them to be human beings again instead of just selfish people. When you see the effect which you've done, oh, that's huge merit. I always love doing that and remembering it. And that keeps me healthy and happy and energized. So when you do some good karma, please celebrate it. Either for you or for somebody else. Can you please elaborate how we can care for something difficult that arises during meditation, such as feeling hungry after past noon when undertaking the eight precepts? If you feel hungry after noon, remember you are going on a diet. And dieting is a beautiful thing. If you don't go on diet, well, look, you say you go hungry. I haven't eaten in the afternoon in 49 years. <laughs> I can't understand it. Actually, I do understand it. This is not fat. <laughs> Every year that you are a monk, you practice loving kindness, compassion. Every year, your heart gets a little bit bigger. <laughs> and after the first 10 years, my heart got so big, it was pressing against my rib cage. It had nowhere else to go except down and out. <laughs> it's, a, it's loving kindness, it's not fat. <laughs> Please doctors, don't, <laughs> don't do an x-ray of me. Okay, and also, music or songs appearing in our mind when meditating while undertaking eight precepts. Look, a lot of times that music which comes into mind, it's just like a habit, you don't need to follow it. But I remember once as a young monk, somebody walked past my room, they had this big radio, and once I heard this old song, I couldn't get it out of my head anymore. And it was, I think they call it an earworm. So after a while, I found it a wonderful method of stopping those music or songs coming into your, or staying in your head and going around and around and around. What I did is when you got towards the end of the song, I don't know what's, such a long time since I listened to songs, say just the British National Anthem, I don't know any other songs. And uh, how does it end anyway? I forget. Okay, that's pretty hopeless, isn't it, that example? But anyway, you just get some sort of song or some sort of melody. Uh, and then at the very end, I go, I keep thinking about it, but do it slowly and more loudly inside my head, like it's coming to a finale. You know, just like, may all beings be happy. May all beings be happy. Because when there's a finale, there's an ending, then it stops afterwards. So I deliberately exaggerate the last part of that song. 
Does that make sense to you? When you exaggerate it and make it a little bit slower and make it like a grand finale, of course, then it stops. And traumatic experience such as being abused, I wish you said that first one first, that last one first. First of all, you know, that abuse happened some time ago. Number two is make sure you have kindness towards that bad memory. And number three, do not try to get rid of it, which is the opposite of kindness. If it's a very painful abuse, we try to escape from it or make it disappear so it never happens again. That is what gives it power. So instead, be kind to what happened and whoever did that to you. But more importantly, be kind to yourself. You know, you are now a damaged tree. You belong now in this wonderful forest of humanity. It doesn't make you more ugly. It can make you more wise and kind and compassionate. And so if that's what's happening, you find you accept it, embrace it. It's no longer a problem. You don't try and get rid of it. You embrace it. Open the door of your heart to whatever's happened to you. You learn from it. It does not diminish you. It doesn't make you a worse human being. It often makes you a better human being, a wiser, more compassionate human being. You could say more on that because that's a deep question, but I'm already over time. I'm a hypersensitive body, empty person. Does meditation help to reduce the symptoms? Yes. If yes, why that I need to take? No. Can you advise? I can't really understand. Uh, understand your writing. A hypersensitive, I, I'm a hypersensitive body, empty person. Does meditation help to reduce the symptoms? If yes, any that I need to take note. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what you mean. The meditation, if it's done properly with kindness, and awareness and peace. It's amazing. The psychological benefit of that is huge. The physical benefit of it is huge. You find that people who are just really the difficult people to live with or live with themselves can grow and become amazing changes in them. What do you say to someone who does not believe in karma and an afterlife? I will say, you will believe in afterlife in your next birth. <laughs> a lot of them do believe in karma and life, but they refuse to admit it. So you just say, well, look at the evidence, look at the science. I had this argument today with somebody. <coughs> they said, we don't believe in this sort of stuff, we believe in science. Who was a scientist before they were a monk? Theoretical physics at Cambridge, you can't get more scientific than that. That is called hard science. And I've never abandoned my science. I've always sort of used it in my practice of meditation, understanding of Dhamma. Science and Buddhism, they go together so incredibly well. That's why I'm a scientist. I'm still a member of the, uh, what is it called, the F Physics Society of Australia or something. That's why I get all these really cool invitations to all these physics conference. You now one of the, I, he's still alive, is Roger Penrose, Sir Roger Penrose. At last he was awarded a Nobel Prize. He was the person responsible for uh, black holes. Hawkins 
turned it the other way around, like a black hole being the origin of this universe, the Big Bang Theory. Roger Penrose was first doing the black holes, genius. And because I still kept my science contacts in Australia, when he visited, I got invited to dinner with him. I didn't have any dinner, just had a couple of orange juice or something, but still, you know, went to talk with him. You know, he's one of the basically the most genius scientists in the world today. And one thing I found about him, in front of a blackboard, he's a genius. When he talks to you, he's socially inept. Now he was a star in science, had all these other scientists at this dinner, and after a while he was a wallflower who was standing next to a wall, no one was speaking to him, he couldn't have a conversation with people, even though he was a genius, socially inept, but a genius in mathematics and physics. Anyway, I try to meditate for 30 minutes every morning. Don't try, just meditate for 30 minutes. Should I use a timer when I meditate? No. Instead, just tell yourself when you start meditation, I will come out of meditation after 30 minutes. I will come out of meditation after 30 minutes. In your own words, three times, pay attention to it, and you'll find that so much more calming and peaceful and effective than setting a timer. I come out of meditation before the 30 minutes is up and I tend to feel that I haven't meditated enough. Exactly. When I ask, when I use the timer sometimes, I feel like I'm just forcing myself to meditate longer. Yes. What is the correct approach here? Don't use the timer. Have you seen me using a timer? That's why I keep talking for too long. <laughs> I don't use the timer. Even when I meditate, I don't use the timer. If I have to come out at a certain time, I tell myself, I have to come out at 10 o'clock, I must stop at 10 o'clock, I must stop at 10 o'clock. I don't even look at the clock. When I stop, it is 10 o'clock. You have your own body, your own mind clock, which is incredibly accurate. Thanks for answering all our questions for the teaching guidance and jokes. Here is a joke I wrote for you. Oh, this is more important. <laughs> What is the favorite dessert of wise monks? You've got here panna cotta. Is that right? Oh, is it a cheese dessert? Well, panna is wisdom. So, panna cotta? I don't think I've ever eaten that. Anyway. It's the favorite dessert of wise monks who, um, is it Italian? Oh, Italian, I said, the favorite dessert, dessert of Italian monks. <laughs> that makes sense? I love Italians who are Buddhist because they do, you know, they love their food and they also can get very deep meditation. There's this one monk, was your monk? No, he was a lay meditator. And he told me during a retreat, he had nimittas. Did I tell the story before? The, the first nimitta, he, it was almost like a, a past life. So the first nimitta was he identified as being a piece of spaghetti. <laughs> a strand of spaghetti, which is weird. His second nimitta was a he was a piece of macaroni. <laughs> and of course, that's to be expected of an Italian monk. He was recording his pasta lives. <laughs> pasta lives. Okay. I'll leave the jokes to you. <laughs> Why do I value thoughts over silence? Because you have more control over thoughts. You can think whatever you want to. Silence is like out of control. It's just there. That's why it is far more beneficial to you. But a bit more scary. You can disappear in silence. 
but thoughts, you're always there doing the thoughts. How to change my value to appreciate silence more? After you've been alive for 72 years, you've thought so much, and I don't know any of my thoughts which have been really useful. The silence has been incredibly useful. And when it comes to solving problems, answers come out of silence, very rarely out of thoughts. And I mentioned that to you about the gentleman in Cambridge who got a Nobel Prize for discovering and proving quantum tunneling after he emerged from the meditation. So silent, these answers to these questions just came up. Perfect. He got a Nobel Prize for that. Genius because he knew the value of silence over thought. Good evening, Ajahn Brahm. I always see purple light before I sleep. Sometimes it is big and bright, sometimes it is small. What should I do? Enjoy it. Stay with it. See if it can stay there for a long time for you. Purple light is one of the best limiters. See how beautiful, how it can be. You know, not deep purple like the rock band, but I mean really excessively beautiful purple light, no purple you've ever seen before in your whole life. Gorgeous color. And that becomes a nimitta which can take you into a deep meditation of jhana. But if you do that before you go to sleep at night, be careful, because if you do get into a jhana, you won't be able to go to sleep. You'll be blissed out and energized all night. But don't worry, because it's worth it. Can you please talk more about Nimitta, especially how to get it still? You be still, and then your Nimitta is still. Don't try and force the object to be still. Let that which is watching you, watching the Nimitta, be still. Please excuse me for doing the questions fast now, because ooh, uh, close to quarter to ten. One of the eleven benefits of cultivating Metta is not being harmed by poisons, fire and weapons. Please explain this, thank you. Do you want to prove it? I already mentioned about weapons, about that fellow who got into a deep jhana and they couldn't cut him. By fire, did I tell the story, this is in the suttas, of the monk who went into the jungle and meditated and these two villagers found him in the jungle meditating and they thought he had died. And they thought we can't leave a Sifu in the jungle to be eaten by the animals. So they decided to cremate him there and then. There's plenty of wood in the jungle. They made a funeral pyre, put the venerable on top, said a few sort of verses, whatever they could remember, which was probably totally wrong. And then they lit the fire and cremated him. And the following morning, they were really surprised but impressed that when he walked into the village for arms, not even his robe was burnt. In these deep meditations, fire and weapons can't harm you. Poisons, in poisons you have to eat that first of all, or you know, take it inside somehow. I don't know how that works, but certainly when your body is so relaxed, it's amazing just what it can do to actually to, uh, I suppose, excrete you know, those poisons without them harming you. Oh, the last question. <laughs> I was really rushing this to the end, please excuse me. Here we go. Good evening, Ajahn Brahm. Good evening question. No, I'm not rushing anymore. On your guided meditations on YouTube, after the initial body scanning, you let us meditate ourselves. What do I do then during the following 30 minutes or so? I mean inwardly, mentally. Do I focus on an object of meditation, for instance, breathing? Thank you, Ajahn Brahm. You don't do anything. 
Stay in the present moment, now. Whatever you're watching, care for it. Let it happen by itself. Don't plan. I do this, then I do that, then I do something else, and it's just like another um, course at a university. This is not like university training. It's learning how to be still and seeing your mind go in, in, in. So the reason I do this is because after the, guide, the guided meditations on YouTube, after the initial uh, body scanning, I ask you to notice peace. You're starting to contact your mental awareness. Go into the present moment. Go into silence. Stop giving things names. When I teach this, that's what I do. And when I get into silence, it's really, really difficult for me to carry on talking to you. The silence is just so attractive. It just stops you talking. So I usually say, I'm now going to let you all be silent. And I ring the, the bell at the end of the meditation. That's why I do that. I can't do anything else. When I teach like this, I follow it and I become really still. But what you do is you just do, do exactly what I do. You're in this present moment. What can you do? It's here. The present moment is right in front of you. When you're silent, you're not giving any names, you can't give yourself any instructions. All those words is like what the government does. They talk, they argue, decide what they're going to do, and they get into trouble because they never get it right. That's what government's for you. That's your brain. You have an argument what you should do. Does it ever really get it right? When you're silent, there's nothing to do except just to enjoy this moment. Enjoy it to the max. This moment right now. And after a while, the moment evolves. You don't tell it which way to go. It, evol it evolves by itself. It gets more and more peaceful. And that's why if you follow those instructions properly, I don't see how anyone can't get nimittas or jhanas. If you sit long enough and don't interfere, you're pointing in the right direction, silent, present moment awareness. The breath will come up, the breath will get very still and beautiful. Nimittas will arise. Why do you get nimittas? They're so gorgeous. If you carry on doing nothing, just watching, they will draw you in. You'll get sucked into them. All the instructions I can give is making sure you know what not to do. Don't get excited. Don't get afraid. Don't try and mess around with them. Don't take notes. Keep that silence. Keep that present moment. And then you soon just get so peaceful, so still. These things happen all by themselves. Then afterwards, you come up and say, Ajahn Brahm, this is what happened to me. Say, so, well done. That's what happens to many monks. The first time which I got into a deep meditation, I didn't know what I was doing. It just happened. And only afterwards, you know, you ask other monks, and you get to understand the path into deep meditation. You notice I'm not saying the path into jhanas, but I think you know what I mean. Because I can't, I can't even claim to get jhanas. That's against my rules. I remember once at a Sri Lankan meditation monastery, they were videoing me. And one of the monks, there's only monks there, no novices, no lay people, they said, Ajahn Brahm, can you get into those jhanas you talk so much about? And they said, there's only monks here, no lay people, so you can't use the excuse, you can't tell others about your internal attainments. They had me. But I said, look, you can probably show this video to all sorts of people. So, I said, this is my answer to you. 
I talk so much about jhanas. Can I enter a jhana? And I replied to them, as I'm replying to you now, Ajahn Brahm cannot get into a jhana. Are you disappointed? Oh. <laughs> and I answer in a much better way. Ajahn Brahm has to disappear first of all. When I get out of the way and stop giving orders and commands, when Ajahn Brahm vanishes, then the jhanas happen automatically. I can't enter them. I disappear first. And I love that answer because that is truthful and that also tells you how to access those jhanas. You, whoever you take yourself to be, with all the wanting to attain things and get things and experience things, become enlightened, you have to disappear first. You don't do it. It happens when you get out of the way and stop obstructing it. Please record that and please write it down afterwards. I don't mind saying that because that's really truthful and very good dharma. And I'm not breaking my precepts. I'm just, just not taking, pretty close to breaking them, but not breaking them. I know the loopholes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it actually gets frustrating as a monk. You've got these rules and I respect them to the max. I won't break them, but sometimes, you know, you want people to get confidence. I know what I'm talking about. That's the only way I can do it. hope you understand. Okay, very good. So, good night, everybody. So, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> okay, thank you again for all listening. And for those of you who are driving home, please drive home peacefully. Those who are here tonight, have a beautiful night here. You can carry on meditating if you want to, do walking meditation, go to the toilet, or just go to sleep and get up at whatever time you want. Please enjoy. And don't force it. Just gently guide the, the body and the mind into the deep meditations. And then when you get close, just disappear. Don't do anything, just let it happen.